This is a vital ingredient for our low carbon future, but making it requires heat. And I need a lot of heat. Today we're all about taking the carbon out of food and drink manufacture. So if you drink beer, eat beans, or maybe fancy a smoothie, what happens here matters to you. Also on the programme... Sophie Ridge helps me to digest all the goings-on at party conferences. Also ahead, the climate scientist who's refusing to fly back thousands of miles from a field trip, even if it'll cost him his job. And Mickey Carroll gets her nails done but it's all in the name of trying out environmentally friendly alternatives to petrochemicals. Here they make a kind of battery, not like this, to store electricity, but something to store heat, vital for decarbonising. This company is designing and building a system for converting spare electricity into stored heat, available when required on tap. It is stored in a giant battery, or even rows of them, similar to the ranks of massive electric batteries now being deployed. Here's another one of their heat batteries. And to be absolutely clear, this stores heat energy inside it, just like this is a battery that stores electrical energy inside it. But these are supersized, designed for industry, which currently gets nearly all its heat from polluting fossil fuels. These are our heat cells, so each one inside them, we take renewable electricity and we heat the centre up to high temperatures, 500 degrees Celsius, and we keep the heat in there with the vacuum insulation which is around them, and then we can store it and we put them next to a factory, and when it wants heat, we can produce steam on demand for whatever process they need. The electricity going into the batteries would come from either the user's own renewable energy sources or from the grid at times of excess like windy nights or very sunny days. Within industry, what kind of tasks would these be relevant for? So we're pretty talking about anything making food or beverages, so brewing, distilling, you know, making baked beans. Everything needs heat and it normally gets used in the form of steam. We would go in and we would help them fit a very large solar farm on next to their site, could be an adjacent field, and we can then allow them to take all of that energy and either use it for electricity or heat. They don't have to export anything. Everything is self-consumed, and we can take really, really large chunks out of their energy demand in a very short period of time. How important do you think these could be in our, in our low energy future? I think we have a huge role to play in decarbonising uh, a large section of industry around heat. Um, it's, it's roughly the same energy as, I guess, of taking 40% of the cars off the road. There's such potential because half of all energy is used for heat and half of that by industry. And heat batteries are relatively cheap. Here they reckon they can store a unit of energy for one-third the price of electric batteries, partly because ingredients and construction are quite simple. Grab your tongs and let's do it. Even I can have a go. Uh, so we've got the stones and they've, they've been They've had a nice heat soak of 600 degrees for quite a while. This is the interesting bit now. If you could grab the very end of that tray, and once you've got it in your hand, if you can take it to the table over there, molten aluminium. Into the stones? Yep, onto the stones via the spout. Kind of evenly if you can. Whoa! That is so cool! This molten aluminium came from recycled car engines. And here is the block I made earlier. Not quite as even as the one the professionals make. Talk me through how you make this in an actual battery, because I know your batteries are, are a lot bigger than one of these. They are a lot bigger than one of those. So to get the heat in, we use a heater element, kind of like this one, and that's exactly the same as you'd find in your kettle. OK, so that, that just got electricity going in, heats up like in a kettle or an immersion heater or something. Exactly like that. We then hold the energy in your thermal block, which you made, Still warm. But much bigger than this. But presumably. much bigger than this. Think a significant size. Right. And then we take the heat out using a coil. And that's kind of like you'd find on the back of your refrigerator. 
This isn't the only heat storage technology under development. For instance, this company thinks storing heat in vast tubs of sand is the way forward. So how does energy storage, especially heat storage, fit into our national energy picture? Even now, we've got periods like here, wind is producing more than half of the country's electricity, and the power price on the system is negative. So if you can consume electricity, you actually get paid for doing it. Really? The minus 88 uh, My, yeah, minus per megawatt hour means if I consumed a megawatt, I'd get paid 88 pounds to Absolutely. do it. If you could charge up your battery and it was 1,000 megawatt hours of storage, you could get 88 grand for doing that. Heat storage is really different. You can store energy for days, for weeks, even for months. So you can start to shift energy from times of excess in the summer or when a big winter storm is passing through to the times when we don't have enough. Storing renewable power in powerful, affordable electric batteries has proven a vital first step in decarbonising energy. Storing heat is step two. There's been a lot of talk about tunnels and infrastructure this week, what with the cancellation of part of HS2. But this one I'm going into isn't for trains, it isn't for sewage either, it's for electricity. Well, to reveal what this tunnel's all about, I'm joined by Mark Lissimore from National Grid. Mark, first of all, where does this tunnel run from and to? Well, behind us a few miles, we've got Crayford out east of the city, uh -huh. and it eventually these tunnels get to Wimbledon right. uh, in the heart of the city on the south side. Now, I said they're for electricity, but give us more detail. I'm guessing it's in here, is it? So these are 400,000 volt cables. We're doing this project to replace old cables that were installed 50, 60 years ago. The old infrastructure was installed in roadways and canal towpaths and was generally oil filled mm -hmm. um, and therefore as it deteriorates causes an environmental hazard. So these cables, not only do they replace those so we can take those out, but they also provide upgraded infrastructure for London to make it fit for purpose for the future. Now, I gather this is partly about reducing disturbance for London, so rather than having to dig up the road all the time when you want to replace things, you've got access down here, not troubling anyone on the surface, is that right? Absolutely, so this provides us with robust infrastructure that can be maintained, that can operate without interacting with the normal operation of the city. Yeah, now there's a lot of talk about how we want to get our future economy based on electricity because it, it's low carbon. I, is this part of that story? This plays a part of that story in providing infrastructure that can serve London for the next 50, 60 years. This provides capacity that can help demand in London grow right. as we decarbonize transport, as we decarbonize heat. We expect demand nationally to grow by about 50% between now and 2035. So, so, so we need to yeah. build that infrastructure. We need to be able to carry more electricity and big projects like this are part of it, I'm guessing. Absolutely, yeah. and this is one of many projects that we've got as part of our Great Grid Upgrade project. Uh -huh. uh, it's, it's a stunning place to be, and I must say it does feel quite sort of James Bondy. I'm wondering if there's a volcano at one end, I'm going to escape at the other. There's been a lot of talk about how the national grid is standing in the way of some of our renewable energy developments. The Prime Minister mentioned problems with it in a speech the other day. What are you doing to make the grid fit for a renewable future? It is a huge challenge that we're undertaking. It's a generational challenge. We're, we've got to spend about five times as much on the network in the next seven years as we have in the last 30. Wow. And we are already underway with 17 mega projects which will help bring new sources of renewable power in from the North Sea, offshore wind predominantly. Um, but ac across the network, across the country, we have programs in place to upgrade the network, connect more customers. It is a huge challenge, but a huge opportunity as well. Because I meet a lot of people who want to get renewable energy projects onto the grid. They say, I'm ready, but I'm being told by the grid, oh, you know, 2030, 2035 at the earliest. Are we going to see the end of that soon? Um, we are working very hard to upgrade our network and also to carry out reforms to the way that people connect to the network. We've had a huge increase in volume in customers who want to connect to the network. We have processes which were designed for a, a very slow incremental moving market. So to make sure that we can connect customers who are ready, who are ready to provide projects to give uh, low carbon power, mm -hmm. battery storage, et cetera, we are working with government, with a regulator to reform the market and do our best to upgrade the network and get customers connected. 
well, it looks like we're coming to the end of the cable, on, on this side at least. When are we actually going to see electricity running through these? Well, we had a major milestone at the weekend, finishing our final breakthrough for the building the tunnels. In about two years' time, we should see power running through these cables from Wimbledon out to the east of the city. We're off to a break now, but when you come back and I get to the surface, we're going to be looking at how bacteria combined with artificial intelligence are helping to replace some petrochemicals. And it's going to involve one of our team getting a manicure. Mind-blowing, gobsmackingly bananas and a death sentence. Just some of the phrases that climate scientists have used to greet the news that September was the hottest ever globally on record. The average temperature last month was 16.38 degrees Celsius, 0.93 degrees above the average for September between 1991 and 2020. 2023 is now on track to be the warmest year on record and around 1.4 degrees warmer than average pre-industrial temperatures. Well, what impact are those alarming temperatures and alarmed responses having on the people that make decisions? The politicians, well, I've come to Sky's Politics Hub and to meet uh, Sophie Ridge, who actually presents the Politics Hub on Sky News. Very nice to see you. It's this really is nice. your place. It is my place. It's great to have you here <laughs> well, with the guest you. visit. Yeah, 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 not for long till your show. No, it isn't. So let's go through to the studio, shall we? I want to show you around. So, so what perplexes me is like the, the two things going on. We seem to have climate scientists and others getting ever more worried and politics possibly going in there. Oh, we don't need to do anything yet direction? Yeah, I think you're right. It's like the pause button has almost been pressed and really it's because of the election. I feel like the, the Conservatives feel there's a dividing line here about cost of living versus the rush to net zero and frankly they're trying to exploit it. Right, they think that there's a, the, there's a weakness here. They can in effect say doing things about the climate will cost you more. I think that's it, exactly. Yeah. Right, here's the studio. Let's go sit down. Thank you. <laughs> feel my heart rate rising a little bit like I'm going to be grilled by you. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing the interview today, it's all right. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I can remember. Um, so, yeah, how did it go down, the message, the, the new message, if you like, about net zero and the fact we can delay our actions? How did it go down in uh, Manchester with the Tories? Honestly, really well. Right. Um, a lot of the Conservative MPs were like, finally, this is a message we can sell on the doorstep. And I feel like the members were quite pro it as well. The thing, I think, to bear in mind is at the minute, the Conservative Party are effectively doing two things. They're saying, yeah, yeah, we can totally meet the net zero goals. That's no problem. But then they're saying, we're just going to pause all these stuff at the same time. Yeah. And, and which a lot of the climate scientists, not least this uh, Jim Ski, who's just taken over at the IPCC, the international body that sort of overlooks these things, he said it's actually not just about the 2050 journey. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about how you get there. The, you know, the climate will be better if we can start addressing these things sooner. So, yeah, we can't just leave it till later. At the minute, everything politically is seen through the lens of yeah. the next election. Yeah. And the Conservatives are frankly desperate to find a dividing line with Labour. They had the Uxbridge by-election, they thought that ULES was something that helped them win it, and they're almost trying to do the same thing on a national level. So when you're up in Manchester, you spoke to the Net Zero Secretary, Claire Coutinho, and uh, put a little bit of uh, her own speech back to her. Yeah, I did. I, I was really struck by something she said in her speech, which she was talking about, no wonder Labour so relaxed about a meat tax. And I was like, well, I've never heard Labour mention a meat tax. So I asked her when it happened, and it was pretty clear that she'd never heard it either. So I guess just kept pressing slightly on it, because I do, I do think there's a serious point here about our public discourse. You know, Keir Starmer has never come out in favour of the meat tax. And again, I guess it comes into what we were discussing about trying to find these dividing lines with Labour on things like net zero, on climate, even when they're not necessarily there. So, is Labour, or even the Lib Dems, a week before or so, are they coming into this space and saying, we're going to proudly have show climate leadership? Mm, I would say no, to be honest. Um, Labour would argue that they do have a very strong green package because they've got the £28 billion a year commitment uh, for the Green Prosperity Plan. Yes, they say that that's going to be delay, they're not going to do it in the first year, but that's still an awful lot of money to be mm. spending on something. Mm. So I think in policy terms, there's a clear dividing line. But in language terms, I think that Keir Starmer is probably worried about a bit of an elephant trap from the Conservatives. So yeah. I don't expect them to be talking about it that much at conference. I'm quite intrigued by this public opinion thing, because you mentioned the Oxbridge by-election. 
the 400 voters or so that swayed that election in, in, in Uxbridge seem to have extraordinary political power because the polls, if anything, they don't really suggest a, a, a big movement against climate action, as far as I can see. But what about individual policies? I, I genuinely i am interested in your opinion. Is, is it the fact that everyone loves the idea of net zero and climate change, but if you say, well, would you be prepared to... You know, sell your diesel car or pay X bit more yeah. money. What's the view then? Well, it is a good question, and of course the, the support wanes. But I gather that's the same as if you ask people, you know, do you support fighting crime? You know, huge majority say yeah. If you ask the question, do you support fighting crime? If that's going to cost you a little bit more, or if mm -hmm. it's going to mean such and such happening on your street, it that's, goes down. That's a fair so point. climate isn't unique in that, and that when you explain mm -hmm. the pain, the support goes down. That's mm -hmm. pretty common. We go back to Glasgow nearly two years ago. Boris Johnson in charge. Now, whether he did enough, he certainly was happy to put climate change in the shop window, wasn't he? Where or why climate has done what it's done in politics and really sunk towards the bottom, it would seem. Genuinely, I think the Oxford by-election, which that, feels that ridiculous, it feels like a butterfly flapping its wings in yeah. Oxbridge and there's a hurricane in Westminster. Like, yeah. it does really feel like that's happened. And I can't help thinking that, you know, the climate scientists, and, and, and they're not like a separate breed, they really represent the scientific, you know, consensus on these things, will be tearing their hair out. What I guess the Conservatives would say, to kind of put the alternative mm. perspective to you, uh, is that they would say, look, delaying things by a couple of years or making it easier in a cost-of-living crisis... And if you look at the global picture, we're already doing an awful lot compared to other countries. That is the message that they are giving. That's the message they were giving at conference anyway. Sophie, thanks very much, and thanks for having me in your place. No, any time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, a scientist who's studying the impact of climate change on people in Papua New Guinea is saying he doesn't want to fly back, as his university employer is demanding, even though his research has overrun by nearly two months, he says he must get the ship back as planned. Now, his university, Kiel, are saying they support sustainable travel, but they really do need him back on the campus. Well, Dr Gianluca Grimalda joins me now from Papua New Guinea. Before we get on to your travel plans, can you briefly tell us what you've actually been doing in, in Papua New Guinea? Yes, I, I'm a social scientist, but I'm inter interested in studying the impact of climate change on uh, uh, the psychology and the way the communities work together. So I sampled the 30 villages from coastal and mountain areas to see whether um, exposure to climate risks make people more willing to help each other or less willing to do so. And how come your plans have mean you've been delayed there for, I think, you know, nearly two months longer than expected? Yes, I mean, two months sounds like a lot, but really a lot happened because uh, we had uh, some major security threats. So at some point we were held a hostage by a group of bandits uh, that uh, confiscated uh, all my belongings and uh, under machete threat, uh, they wanted a ransom to get Ma it Machete, back. machete threat, right, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, machete. Um, so, yeah, there they were quite serious incidents. So, of course, I had to cancel all the locations in that area. Uh, I had to reschedule the research, go, go and find uh, new communities. Uh, we had also some episodes of theft from a, be within my research group. So, yeah, all of what could have happened did happen. The university want you back. They want you to do your work back at Kiel. Uh, why are you so determined not to fly? I mean, I can see that uh, my university has a point because, uh, yeah, in principle, I promised that uh, I would be back on the 10th of September and uh, I was not there. I, I was still in Papua, just about to finish my fieldwork. But the thing is that uh, there is nothing, really nothing that I must do in Kiel that I cannot do while traveling. So I find their request as uh, basically completely unreasonable. And I think uh, in the current uh, age of uh, uh, climate collapse, you know, we, we are seeing that the climate is literally collapsing under our our own feet. It's no longer acceptable that uh, I waste 3.6 tons of CO2 just for the whim of my um, of my employers. The, the plane will still take off without you and it's a tiny amount of carbon. Isn't this a rather, you know, pointless gesture? Yes, but, you know, it's a part of boycotting. So if more and more people give less money to the aviation industry, then um, planes will not take off. So how are you proposing you'll get back? 
I have found uh, uh, cargo ships to get out of this island. Actually, that was uh, the most complicated uh, part of the trip because uh, uh, cargo ships, in principle, are not allowed to take passengers. So we had to ask authorization to the National uh, Maritime Authority of uh, Papua New Guinea. We got a uh, permission, fortunately. So now I'm going, I'm waiting for the, the uh, first cargo ship to leave uh, and then off uh, I will go. Dr. Grimalda, thank you very much indeed for your time and safe and swift-ish travels. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, what do tyres, nail varnish remover and chocolate spread have in common? They've all got ingredients within them that can be quite harmful to the environment. Things like palm oil, acetone or isoprene. Well now, people are coming up with synthetic, allegedly less damaging ways of making these chemicals. Our very own Mickey Carroll has been out to get her nails done. Why didn't they choose me? A nail salon may not be the traditional frontier for scientific breakthroughs, but that could soon change. Every time you do your nails, you're probably coming into contact with acetone. It can take off your nail varnish or soak off your gel nails, and it's everywhere outside the salon too. But acetone, and many of the other chemicals you find around your house, is made using fossil fuels meaning their production can have a big impact on the planet. So, let's pop some lab coats on. There's one for you to enjoy yeah. that, Mickey. Over in Camden, scientists are fermenting their own acetone in what they think could be a totally new, environmentally conscious way of making it. So, what's going on in here then? So, in here, we're making everyday ingredients that you find on the back of products using biofermentation and all of that is driven by our bespoke artificial intelligence programs. The scientists are causing biological reactions in sugar cells to produce different chemicals. It's the same process used to brew beer, except here they're brewing acetone. This looks like something out of, out of Frankenstein. It does a bit, doesn't it? Mm. Uh, but it's actually a really cool piece of equipment. It's called a fermenter. And just like in a brewery, you have much larger versions, steel tanks, and in there your delicious beer is being made. We're doing something very similar, but we're making acetone instead. So we're testing here whether it works, whether it works at this uh, size, so that we can then take it into a much larger scale. But this isn't just about nail varnish remover. The team here are using AI to replicate how they make their acetone so that they can replace other damaging chemicals. Crucially, palm oil. Huge amounts of palm oil are produced globally every year. Almost 74 million metric tonnes were made last year but it's also a major driver of deforestation in some of the world's most biodiverse forests and can lead to soil degradation as well. All sorts of different personal care type products, so shampoos, shower gels, moisturisers, soaps, contain uh, different types of fatty acids uh, that would typically come from uh, hyper-intensive farming, such as palm oil. So we can, instead of um, relying on palm oil, we can make the fatty acids instead and that can go into these products. If this all sounds too good to be true, you might be right. Dr Chris Chuck, who researches synthetic palm oil, says not all fermented chemicals are automatically good for the planet. We have to do this right. So you've got to make sure that what you're feeding them is sustainable. So for example, um, if you uh, use um, agricultural residues or uh, food grade food waste, then you have a much more sustainable process and much lower emissions than if you're growing uh, sugar directly just to feed the process. So that's one really important factor of getting that right. As the industry tries to replace damaging ingredients, they could start popping up in your daily life. You know I mean? For now, you can just enjoy getting your nails done. Nice. Mickey Carroll, Sky News. Well, that's it for the show for now. Remember, you can catch up on all your climate and environment news on the Sky News website and app, or by scanning the QR code that's on your screen right now. See you next week.